So we like to give you that time for fellowship because that's important, you know. You're out there surrounded by the world all week long and, don't, you know, we live so far apart sometimes and we have things that we deal with and, and it's helpful to talk to other believers with the right perspective about those things and, uh, you know, you know that you can find someone here to talk to when you're going through things who will care, <laughs> right, and, and try to help if they can. And so that's all good. Fellowship is very important, I think, in the body. We're, you know, all the gifts you're given are for the sake of other people, uh, largely for other people inside the congregation that you're part of. And so, you know, if we don't give you time to talk, and <laughs> then, then how does that happen, you know? Either, and, and some people like to leave really quick afterwards, and other people, I can't get them out the door. <laughs> but, you know. Um, but eventually, we're all part of one body. God puts a congregation together. He knows uh, the skills and abilities and talents that everyone has. And, uh, and we believe that people who join us do so because he put them here, that it's not a mistake. Am I live? Mm -hmm. Oh. <laughs> um, OK. So this week, uh, I'll, we're going to talk about our readings again a little bit. I might go a little bit faster because at some point, uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about Hanukkah. How many people have not celebrated Hanukkah before? Okay, so a couple. So, you know, so we want to maybe go over some basics because it's going to start before we meet again, right, next week. So. Uh, when I get to that part, you know, stay alert. I'm going to ask questions for the people who've done it several times or more than several times um, and uh, get you involved. And maybe there'll be some questions from the back, right? Okay. So confusion. And there we go. So we were reading... Um, Last week, through a toldot, through the generations or genealogy uh, or history, toldot can be uh, translated as history. And so when someone, somebody asks you, is Genesis history? Well, it says so <laughs> several times uh, with the word toldot. This is the history, the genealogy, or the generations of the heavens and earth. This is the history or the genealogy or the generations of so-and-so and so-and-so. And, -so. and we got to the point where we were reading uh, the history or genealogy after the flood. And uh, we read about Nimrod, right? And a lot of people, people who weren't here didn't get a lot of this because we were cut off <laughs> yeah, we <were laughs> by Facebook. Yeah, yep. yep. Uh, with all that material about Noah and his tent, apparently, or something. I don't know. Um, but And we were learning about how the world was divided. And not just the people divided, but the world being divided. And then so this week, it, it went a little bit deeper into that, right? We were reading more specifically uh, about those happenings with Nimrod and uh, how he established this place called Bavel, which Keith did uh, his Torah reading on Bavel, about confusion. And uh, in English translations, you see that name is Babylon. But in Hebrew, it's Bavel. I didn't put your Hebrew letters this time, but that's how you would pronounce it. Everyone say Bavel. Bavel. Okay. Yeah. And it has a meaning. It's confusion. There's uh, the region where Bavel was, is Mesopotamia, you know, between the Tigris and Euphrates area there in the Middle East, uh, modern day Iraq, okay? Um, and it went from one city, he didn't just uh, build one city, he, he was, uh, there are several cities that he became the ruler of. You could say it was the first empire on earth, okay? And he was subjugating people, this, this man called Nimrod, who was called a great hunter, and he was the first ruler of the earth. He was subjugating people. Okay. 
So why this name Babylon? Well, I think he stole, stole all the thunder there uh, with his drosh, which is fine, though. It was very good. Um, so basically, though, in, in, in Akkadian, which is the language of the Babylonians, it had a different meaning, which is what now? Oh, he I forgot. My notes. <laughs> <laughs> Something about ga the gate of God. Gate of God. Right. So that's what they meant it, but in, in Hebrew it meant something different. Right? It means confusion. Confusion. Okay. And so it's obvious we can figure out why that why we gave that name to the city, because that's where God created a lot of confusion for people and they were all divided from that point. So I won't ask those questions. They're a little too simple. Well, it's the last one, right? Do you think it always had that name? Do you think in Hebrew we called it confusion before? <laughs> do you think Hebrew even existed then? How old do you think Hebrew is? Was it the first language? You guys are very quiet. Yes. Yes. Yes? Yes. Which one is the yes? yes. It was that the it's the oldest language. language. You believe it's the yes. oldest language? The first language? Okay. A lot of scholars would disagree, but I agree. <laughs> You know, um, they used to say it was a very new language, but uh, evidence is popping up of Paleo-Hebrew in different places in Egypt. It was, uh, of course, in Egypt for a while it was a language of slaves, and so you found it in places like caves, uh, not on, you know, fancy temples or papyri because we didn't have those. And um, that's what the Egyptians had. And, you know, just because you aren't uh, finding ancient writings that are uh, well kept, you know, were able to be stored properly f over thousands and thousands of years, doesn't mean that those languages didn't exist, right? Doesn't mean they didn't exist. So, and I think uh, maybe that name, though, changed after the event. Make sense? Okay, Nimrod's wife, we talked a little bit about her, Smeramis, her name, and her claim, or many claims, right, that she was a goddess eventually, that she, uh, her husband, after he died, impregnated her with the rays of the sun and all of that, and uh, how she came down herself as, as an egg from the heavens, <laughs> right? In the worship system, we talked about that last week again, that her the priests would impregnate virgins, and the next year they would sacrifice the babies, and uh, right, and they would dip eggs in the blood of the sacrifices. Thus, your first, in a different language, her name was Ishtar, so the first Ishtar eggs. Yeah, you might see a similarity in that name, very close to a name maybe you're more familiar with. Okay, we talked about that last week a little bit, so. Uh, and if you think about it, this is real. What this really was was the an early case, or maybe the very first case of ancestor worship, which is still prevalent today. It's how the, uh, the you know we weren't there. So when you look at the Greek pantheon, for example, did it evolve from actual human beings who uh, were looked up to because they were so powerful or had different abilities or something and eventually people thought of them as gods or you know or and in, in which case it would be ancestor worship or were they uh, the malachim that we uh, read about or the or the sons of God who came down and uh, mated with human females for example we don't know which one maybe there's a little bit of both right uh, we have stories of people in different uh, mytholo mythologies who are like half human, half God, and we don't know, we weren't there, but there are possibilities. And we do know, though, that ancestor worship is something that we see all around the world. And in a lot of different cultures, it's still very preval prevalent in Africa even today. Um, and the beginning of all that came from Bavel, a place called Confusion. As a matter of fact, many false systems at the very root come 
from Bavel. Okay. Spread over the earth. You can read more about that in depth in the book, which is a difficult read. I'll grant you it's, it's Old English, uh, the two Babylons by Hislop. I'm surprised, I would be surprised if maybe someone hasn't um, made a new version in more modern English. I'm not <laughs> sure though, I've never seen it. <laughs> if you find one, let me know. <laughs> but uh, it covers many aspects of maybe your own faith that have come from pagan roots and you can see what those roots are. And, and that's a good thing to know. I think anything that you do, especially if it has to do with your faith system, your beliefs and your practices, you should know what it is you're doing. A lot of people have no clue uh, about many things that they do. Uh, bonfires, do you know what, anything about bonfires? What, what's really the name, right? Bonfire. Bonefires, uh, sacrifices, human sacrifice burned and creating fires. Uh, I, I don't think many people are thinking of that when they today have a bonfire, of course, hopefully, hopefully. <laughs> right? Um, but there are some roots to things that we do that we should be aware of and uh, because all of our lives should honor God. Do you agree? Yes. Okay. Uh, ties to humanism as well. Uh, in humanism, you, you know, that's basically replacing God with, with people, right? Uh, the people that are honored in the idea of humanism. Well, there, there are different types of humanism, by the way, too. Uh, one was within Christianity with Erasmus and whatnot, but that's not the kind we're talking about. This is humanism that dispenses with religion and sees, God, uh, sees man as the ultimate in in the universe, which doesn't really move God, uh, man upward so much as it just does away with God, and that's what you're left with. And uh, so I don't know, in their minds, uh, they think of the word worship, but they do honor different men uh, very highly. Paganism, paganism, who could tell, anybody know what paganism is? What's paganism? What's at the root of that? Folks, first of all, you could see how humanism was tied to that, right? Samarimus was a real, actually a human. Nimrod was actually a human. The sun Tammuz was actually a human. It wasn't, you know, Nimrod didn't die and become the sun, <laughs> right? She didn't really fall in an Easter egg or, uh, you know, whatever. Okay, um, so paganism, instead of worshiping the creator, you're worshiping the creation. And you're giving names to different gods of different things in the creation. There's a god, you know, in, in Hinduism, which they don't call it Hinduism themselves, by the way. But in that faith system, there's a god for everything. There's a god for this river. There's a god for that rock. There's a god for this mountain. There's a god for, for this city. Uh, the Greeks had, that's what uh, Athena. Athena was the goddess of Athens. Not Hinduism, but you see the tie. Uh, also paganism. There were, in Greek, you had uh, figures that inhabited rivers and caves and things that were more than human uh, in their mythology as well. So paganism, your worship, basic idea, you're worshiping the creation rather than the creator. Does that where Greek mythology comes from? That's where Greek mythology comes from. Oh, well, Greek mythology is also tied to paganism, like the Athena idea, yeah. Uh, Zeus throwing lightning bolts. Where does lightning come from? Well, <laughs> yeah, you have a storm god, Thor, in the Norse. You have the goddess of the, yeah. Where did the worship of Baal begin? I, that's the one I see the most in the Bible. Baal, and uh, well, actually, that's a little bit tricky. Uh, we do see that name appear in, in different Baal. Baal, yeah. And, and actually there's uh, that word in Hebrew actually means, much like Adon, it really means Lord, but it's a little, a little bit different of a nuance, as well as being used in the scripture as we have it today for a name of this Canaanite god 
Um, but there is some evidence and there, there are some scholars out there who contend that that was not even the name of this god, but that, na but that has been superimposed. Like we put Adonai instead of the name of God, that Baal, being an evil god, we didn't want to use that name. We put, we, so we wrote Baal on there. <laughs> I can superimpose it. I don't know, I wasn't there, but that's a, <laughs> but that is a scholarly argument that's out there. Now, I don't know if they were first. Uh, there, you know, there's a battle in, in, uh, among scholars about that as well. But it was one of the gods in their pantheon. Whether they alone had him, I don't believe so. I, I think the Akkadian, you know more about it? No, 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 I was going to comment something else. Okay. No. Okay. I was well. going to say paganism. That a good example of paganism would be Tammuz, and the um, what is it? The winter equinox or winter solstice. Yeah. Right. That would be a good example of paganism, I would think. Yeah. Um, and so he, in effect, and and there are different cultures that have the same idea. This god dies. <laughs> And the world mourns, and it goes into a cold state. It has to be reborn, and uh, and some it's like his mother goes to Hades or somewhere to bring him back. Uh, different cultures have different, but the story is very similar in different cultures. Some somebody makes a sacrifice in order to bring him back. They they live in some netherworld or something in order to let him go uh, and come back to the world and refresh the world. This kind of idea. Um, 40 days long, isn't it? Like Lent? 40. 40 days, yeah. Parallel Which is, again, a parallel to Catholicism, right? There's <laughs> right before Ishtar, it was 40 days of weeping for Tammuz. And you read about that in the scripture, in the Tanakh, actually. Uh, it's one of the things that's condemned the, the, that drove us into exile because people in Israel at that point were into paganism. They were worshiping, it says, in the very walls of the temple, they were worshiping everything you could think of. Every god or goddess that was out there was being worshiped inside the walls of the temple. Like hidden. You think of the temple like there's a wall and it's just a big court. Or so. No, there were you know so a series of rooms on the sides of the temples. And inside the, those rooms, they were worshiping everything. And you read about worshiping the sun. You come out in this one gate and worshiping towards the east when the sun rises. And, and all these different gods. And it's just so pathetic. All the idolatry and the paganism that has infiltrated. And it's not a good thing. And it all goes back to Nimrod and Bavel and Samarimus in the place called confusion. And that's really the point. This is from there we get ideas uh, Hellenism, this, this idea of subjugating people uh, via the mighty hunter or via his wife who creates this false religious system to make people comply uh, under them. And Hellenization uh, by the enlightened Greeks with their system of paganism, who, you know, would uh, at first, just much like the Romans, uh, come in with their religion and I talked a little bit about this last week, it was very common, and allow the conquered people to keep their gods, right? But you had, but they had to honor your gods as well. Now maybe at first they're just flat out tolerant. You can worship your way, we'll worship our way, we're all good, and you look, and this files into the story of the Maccabees and Hanukkah, which we're hitting next week. They come in first very tolerant. Alexander the Great actually was shown uh, that the that the Tanakh talks about him, right? It's in the book of Daniel. And he was astounded, and, he would, and so he studied the Torah, apparently, for a while. Not that he accepted uh, and threw away all his systems of belief and followed, you know, Adonai, but he did accept Adonai as a god. Hellenization. Simil uh, and this idea of universalism that will come up soon, um, where there are many gods, but our gods are the best. That's why we beat you in the war, mm -hmm. sort of idea, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and we've read that in the kings recently, that one of the kings we just read about 
he was being defeated in battle, and so he abandoned Adonai and sealed the doors to the house of Adonai and started worshiping all these other gods from the places around, the gods of Ashur, the gods of, of uh, uh, the one to the northwest there, <laughs> north of Lot. Anyway, uh, all these other gods started worshiping them instead, all these pagan gods. So Hellenization is the idea that the Greeks were bringing culture, their culture, to the rest of the world that they were conquering, sort of creating, in a sense, an early form of universalism uh, to some degree. Now, there's more to universalism, of course, than that, uh, but creating a one-world kind of religion, at least within their empire, where maybe they could have as many little gods as you want, you people who we conquered, but our gods, you know, they're supreme. You have acceptance. They come in first, they tolerate, then it comes into a system of intolerance after a while. We know that the Romans used to allow people in, in the 3rd, 4th century BC, you know, they would let people keep their gods, everything was fine. But by the 1st century AD, you know, you either worship the Roman gods and make sacrifices to them, or you've had it. Um, and for a while, there was an exception for the Jewish people. Um, and that was on and off after the first century. Well, actually, th after 70 AD, somewhere around there. Uh, so very, they became very intolerant. Assimilation. What does assimilation mean? Like made to be like? Yeah, you enter, some, you enter some other culture and you change your ways, your religion, your way of life, the foods you eat, the w clothes you wear, uh, this, and everything else. You start to assimilate. You become more and more like the people around you. You assimilate. Uh, Star Trek people here. <laughs> but the Borg was the Borg, right? You, yeah, resistance is futile. You, you will be assimilated, right? Uh, and we have to be careful wherever we live that we are not assimilated. We're supposed to, we are in the world, but we're not supposed to conform to the world. What are we supposed to do instead? Be transformed by the renewal of the mind. By the renewal of the mind. We're not to conform to this world, to whatever culture tells us and dictates. And that's very important these days. <laughs> you know, we say that, but I, I imagine any time period in history, you could say that as well. Uh, but some maybe more than others, right? 19, if we lived in 1930s Germany, uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty, uh, pretty good get there. Are good character. So assimilation, we see the Samaritans. The Samaritans, of course, were people who had been, when we went into exile, the Assyrians transplanted people from other areas to what used to be the northern kingdom of Israel in Shomron and some, and, or Samaria in many of your Bibles. And they brought their, all of their false gods with them, their paganism and everything. And they were worshiping their gods and lions started to eat them, right? It was, scripture tells us. And they, you know, they were praying to their gods and their gods wouldn't do anything about it. So they complained to the Assyrians. They said, help, we need somebody to show us you know, how to placate the God that's in this area. We don't know what he requires. And so they sent some Kohanim and some Leviim, just a few, back to teach them. And apparently they didn't really teach them very well or they would have, or they would have known that he requires you only worship him. Um, but they kept all their own gods and worshiped Adonai at the same time. This was the religious system in the early days of the Samaritans. Uh, they worshiped God, but they worshiped all their other gods too. Right? Okay, that, uh, the Samaritans. And then later on, when, um, I believe in the days of the Maccabees, Alexa or earlier than the Maccabees, Alexander the Great allowed the Samaritans to build a huge temple up on one of the mountains. I think it was Mount Gerizim, which you can go to today. I think you can see the remnants. And if you look down onto Shechem, uh, where some things happen in the Bible, uh, and Jacob's well is down there and whatnot. Um, but they built a temple up there to Adonai. But when the time of the Maccabees came, they, they 
ask for permission, they change that temple into a temple for Zeus. Zeus. They, they, can, they transform it into a temple for Zeus because they saw what was happening to us. You might say they assimilated. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Then we have terms uh, syncretism. Syncretism. Syncretism might, you know, uh, it depends. It could be maybe a better, uh, a better description of the Samaritans in the early stages because, again, they were worshiping God, but they were also worshiping their own gods. So they were bringing different religions together. This is very much like much like what happened in much of the church uh, in the early centuries. Not so much in the first century until very late, maybe a little bit. Um, we didn't call it a church. Other people put that label on it. Um, there are two words in Hebrew, two words in Greek. We'll cover that some other day. Uh, nevertheless, if you're thinking of it as body of Messiah, right, or the congregations of God, <laughs> then uh, it fits a little bit better with the biblical narrative. Okay. So syncretism is merging of religions, which is something that you see happening today. Uh, you see the Pope having Muslims come to the Vatican and pray. I never thought I'd see that, but that sort of thing is happening. Um, right? They're, they're teaching in schools um, that the God of Islam is the God of the Bible. Now, they're not supposed to be teaching anything in schools about religion that I remember. And I, I thought that the Bible was shunned and all of this, but they're teaching classes on Islam. Islam's point of view is that, they're, that they have superseded the Bible with their text uh, and that their God is the God of the Bible. And uh, if you ever, but it doesn't really fit the narrative, does it? Because the, the scripture says that Yeshua is son of God and and this sort of thing. But if you look on the mosque, on the Temple Mount, it says very clearly and very purposefully, there is, you know, God is one and he has no son. I don't know if you know what it means when you look at it, but that's what it says. Uh, and so their answer to this would be that, um, that the scripture that we have is corrupt, okay? They say that the child of promise for example, is not Yitzchak and then Yaakov, but that it was Ishmael. And though our Bible says otherwise, that's one of the things they'll say, well, that's because your Bible is corrupt, right? It's very simple. If anything is, is discovered as discrepancy, well, they would just say, well, that's because yours is corrupt. <laughs> anyway, uh, so syncretism, uh, in syncretism, you can see with the worship of Dagon, right, or Dagon. Dagon, the fish god, right, who was worshipped in Assyria, also worshipped in Canaan. See, there's a tie there again, more than one culture worshipping that same false god. It was a fish god, and so you had the priests wore these hats, which, yeah, uh, you see very tall hats, and it looks like a, a fish mouth, right? Mm -hmm. It's open. Mm -hmm. And if you look uh, at pictures of the Pope we were talking about not too long ago, mm -hmm. you'll see that one of the types of hat he wears is very much like the, the uh, hat that the priests of Dagon wore. Mm -hmm. How did that happen? We also, I remember the name of the, the cap. Um, there's someone that's worshipped by many children around the world this time of year. <laughs> say it that way, I'm yeah. half joking, maybe a little less than half. Um, when the faith in Yeshua started to promulgate and spread, and many Roman soldiers actually came to the faith, many, some of the officers were coming to the faith as well, but, in a, in, but many were in a corrupted form. They were kind of mixing it with Mithra, Mithraism, uh, which again is another pagan religion and it was popular, especially in the area called Phrygia. And so part of the, that worship system, they would wear these things, uh, these special hats that they had were called Phrygian caps. 
that was the name I was trying to think of last week, Phrygian cap, and I don't know if you looked it up, but you could Google it, Phrygian cap, and you'll see there are sculptures, very ancient sculptures of people wearing these Phrygian caps as a, a form of their pagan worship, and it's got, uh, you know, it's very fluffy here, right? And then it kind of just, it, it could go up into like a point, but it just kind of flops over. Uh, might seem kind of familiar this time of year, to go to the mall or something, for example, see a guy in a red suit <laughs> wearing a Phrygian cap. I'm sure he doesn't call it that, but that's where that model came from, the Phrygian cap. Okay, universalism. We're, universalism, we're talking about, when you hear that term, we're talking about a one world religion. Yes. One world religion. Everyone, you know, you read about this in Revelation that's going to happen one day. There'll be a one world religion, right? Have you read about this? There'll be, you know, the beast and, the, you know, his false prophet, and there'll be someone over the whole one world religion and everything. Now, one world religion is a great idea in some respects. That's what Yeshua is going to do. He's going to come back, and there'll be a one world religion. Problem is, uh, the false prophet here, he's going to have a false one world religion, right? Uh, which, will ha which will be a, a religion of universalism and syncretism, where all these different religions are kind of mixed together, right? Keep everybody happy. We don't want to offend anybody, so we'll mix everything together. Uh, in, certain, in certain religions today, for example, uh, in one, if not more, groups uh, uh, that call themselves Christians, uh, voodoo is acceptable. I don't know if you know this, right? Does that sound like something that should be acceptable if you read the scripture, if you read the Torah, for, for example? Okay. It's clearly not, but... Uh, for some, they say it is. Universalism, one of the ideas in universalism is that uh, no one will go to, uh, the, to Gehenna or Gehenna. One of those Greek, one is Hebrew, by the way, different ways to describe the Valley of Hinnom where the fires never go out, which in your English Bibles, except for the complete Jewish Bible, will probably say hell, right? So they, in universalism, no one goes to hell. Well, how I? No one. <laughs> Nobody. So they say that. even if you die in rebellion against God, then he is just, I mean, God is love. So you're going to have another chance. When you, you, when you see the judgment of the, of the great serpent, you know, the dragon, the devil, uh, then when you see that judgment and then it comes your turn, you know, you still have an opportunity and who would be dumb enough to turn God down then, right? So everyone's going to make it. That's universalism, part of universalism. Okay. Does it match the Bible? Anyone? No. <laughs> okay. Um, I think maybe, maybe we could have a study this week and talk about next week. Everyone go home and find scriptures that would disprove universalism. Would that be hard? No. No, probably not even hard, right? Good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> all right, universalism. Now we have creation and science. Uh, so all of these ideas, like, remember the root of them all is coming from this place called Bavel, where these f this fake religious system began and it spread and, and different names were attached in different, in different places, uh, maybe the methodology of worship was very similar. We change a little bit, little bit, little bit, right? Uh, but some of the similarity is there throughout <laughs> cultures around the world. Even the Tower of Bavel, you see it was most likely those, like those ziggurats, the step pyramids, it was most likely like one of those. And that's the kind of pyramid that you see all around the world. You see them in Southeast Asia, you see them in Central America and South America, you see them everywhere. Okay, um, then we have creation and science, and those are not, let me say it again, those are not opposing ideas. Okay, God created the universe, he made all the rules by which it exists. And those rules by which it exists are science. 
I was reading today in the, that book, Secret Jews, um, and really focus on, um, on Jewish people who were forced to convert and this sort of thing in the, uh, in the Middle Ages and how they were persecuted and whatnot. And then it gets into conversos and, and the different ideas in conversos and how some of them became sort of skeptical not hard to believe after all they went through being persecuted so much like how can there be a god this is horrible i mean it can't be it can't be our god from the bible you know from the bible because why would we be going through this uh, so it's so terrible and then he'd be like well it can't be their god they're so evil look what they're doing to us and so they're stuck between a rock and a hard place if they could have found messianic judaism they would have been great they would be like oh now i get it but they <laughs> but they weren't able to uh see that you know the biblical you know, that rides the middle of those two. Um, and instead, they became skeptics. And uh, in that skepticism, you started to see ideas uh, how about science and how um, miracles don't really fit well with science, you know. And the idea, if you go if you dive into it, right, uh, the idea within atheistic scientific communities about why miracles can't happen, it's circular. It's, it's because, well, because they're miracles. <laughs> and so they can't happen. Well, you mean they can't happen because they can't happen. That's your <laughs> argument. Well, yeah, any, any reasonable mind would, would agree. Oh, okay. That sounds logical, sure. <laughs> anyway, that's what you call a circular argument, right? I can prove that miracles don't happen because, you know, they're miracles and miracles can't happen. Well, you just said the same thing over again. You didn't prove anything. Okay, so uh, miracles, when they do happen, they're something you, you, normally something you see, right? In the real physical world, you know, the sea being divided or walls falling down. Now, in the physical, you know, like this book, uh, I was watching a special today, right? This morning, it's, it was very cool. This is, like I said, the word toldot can mean history. It's like this is really like history. It tells you what happened. Science is something that tells you how something happened. It's not meant to tell you what happened, but how something happened. If you get that confused, and you look at science to tell you what happened, uh, you can run into some difficulties. There was a, um, a scientist who was standing at a deep riverbed that had, you know, with like canyon walls on both sides of him, holding up a rock, and he was saying, he was, he was talking about, he said, how long do you think this little stream, you know, took to forge this great big canyon with these huge walls on both sides of me here. See this rock here? How old do you think this rock is and everything? Is He's like, this rock was dated to 150,000 years old. And then he said, but it might surprise some of you to know that I'm older than this rock. <laughs> it, was, it was the, see, that whole canyon was not forced by millions and bazillions of years. They like to use big dates as if big dates can solve all geological uh, issues that you run into, which most geologists themselves with doctorates who are in the field have discarded that theory. Um, instead, that whole thing was formed, I, I believe it was the 1980s in Northwest, Northwestern United States when and if any of you are old enough, you might remember when Mount St. Helens exploded. Mm -hmm. yep. And I have some great videos if you want to check them out. Let me know uh, on specifically on Mount St. Helens explosion and, and the ge geological changes that happen in the, in the area because of that. As well, and, and incorporated in that, is how quickly uh, strata were formed with fossils in different layers from the lava that came out from Mount Helens in the 1980s. Fossilization was very rapid. And certain things tended to go towards the top and certain things, you know, farther down. Anyway, so science is not opposed to creation. What you're looking at is the same data, but interpreting it with different worldviews. If your worldview 
tells you it must be old and this, you know, uh, we must have evolution and yada yada, then you're going to interpret that data and try to make it fit your model. We actually have a book that tells us what actually happened, so we know uh, how to better how to fit that data into actual history. Okay. Moral confusion. At least we also wind up with moral confusion from these things. Now we're to the point in moral confusion. I mean, when you have uh, a priesthood, sorry, I gotta stay close here. You have a priesthood that actually is having you sacrifice babies and things like that. Clearly, something's gone wrong with your moral values. Now, we, have, we exist in the community today where we've gotten to the point, not only is there evil in our society, but we have people in our colleges teaching our children saying things like, does evil actually exist? Is there really such a thing as evil? I mean, good and evil, they're all, they would say, they're all really totally subjective. There are cultures where this is evil, but other cultures where that is not evil. So isn't it really all just subjective? <coughs> if Terry was to go and meet one of those professors in the parking lot, beat them up, take their keys and steal their car, I think the professor might change their mind and know that there's such a thing as evil. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, nevertheless, what we're really talking about, when it, comes down to rea when it comes down to reality, and we see this in the scripture, and I keep bringing it up when you're reading through the books of the kings, is that think this king or that king were either good or evil, the text says, in the eyes or from the perspective of Adonai. And it's his perspective that matters. He's the one who created the universe. He's also the one who, who's, we call him king of the universe. He's the one who makes the rules. If he says something's good, it's good. If he says something's evil, it's evil. And thank God we have a good God who cares about people, loves people, and makes laws that are actually good for people. All of his laws in the Torah, it says specifically are for our own good. Amen. The things that have to do, it, do with diet, it's because those are things our systems are meant to eat. And things that wouldn't, uh, that our eating them wouldn't hurt the uh, ecology of our planet. You know that catfish clean rivers? Mm -hmm. uh -huh. So if we eat all the catfish, right, they eat the garbage out of the rivers, they clean the rivers. If we eat all the catfish, <clears throat> what's cleaning the rivers? If we eat all the shellfish and the crab and these things clean, clean the oceans, if we eat all of those, what's cleaning the oceans? Now, I want you to pause there for a second and think about how polluted our rivers and oceans are right now. Mm -hmm. How much better might they be? I mean, yes, there's irresponsibility as well, people dumping, and mostly, and, and it's, it's not generally in the United States, by the way, uh, well, we have our share. Uh, the worst contributors are other country, a couple of other countries in the Far East. Look it up. All right, uh, moral confusion. Uh, and is there really such a thing as truth? This is something that in the first century, um, Pilate struggled with. What, what is truth? Right? Um, and now, in the postmodern generation, we have a common saying, right? It might, that might be right. That might be true for you, but that's not true for me. Well, yeah. is, is, that, is that really possible? Yeah. Uh, what they're really saying is, you might think that's true, but I don't think that's true. I think this is true. But and in essence, the, the foundation of that is there is no real truth. But is there real truth? Yeah, there's absolutely no real truth, they would say. <laughs> they say, do you believe that absolutely? Absolutely no absolute if you absolutely believe that, it's absolutely, no absolute, that you, it's absolute truth for you. You just, you just, yeah. 
more like killed your own argument. Truth. Huh? It's more like a subjective truth. Yes, um, what they're truth. really buying into is that everyone cr can create their own truth. Mm -hmm. Whatever you believe, which is why we have gender confusion now. Mm -hmm. I was born a boy, but you know, today I think I'll identify as a giraffe or whatever else. <laughs> by, by the way, there was an interesting story, in the, I think it's in the Talmud, right? Where there's a, a king, one of the king's sons uh, thinks of himself, it's in the devotional. What does he think yeah. he is again? A chicken or something? Or? Uh, turkey? Yeah, I think he's a turkey. a turkey. Yeah. So he thinks he's a turkey. <laughs> and he's, he takes off all his clothes because, you know, he's a turkey. And he goes and he lives under the dining room table. So the, the king called in this, this uh, scholar, happened to be a rabbi. And the rabbi came in. He took all his clothes off and got under the table. <laughs> right? <laughs> and after a while, he, he sat there with him, not making any noise. And then he asked for a shirt. He started putting on the shirt. He said, oh, you're a turkey. I'm a turkey, too. Turkeys can talk, didn't you know that? Right? Then he asked for a shirt and he puts a shirt on, right? And these other guys look, he puts his son that's looking at him. He says, Turkeys can wear shirts, didn't you know that? You know, it's a little chilly in there. So after a while, the, the kid asks for a shirt, right? And he does that uh, piece by piece until the son is, is wearing completely dressed and eating food again, because he wasn't eating food, and, and sitting at the table to do it. So he might have still called himself a turkey, which he never was. But anyway, it's a whole. I don't know why I even brought that up. It's interesting. <laughs> In other words, <laughs> you know, things that used to be considered mental illnesses are now accepted as normal behavior. We've gone from accepting immorality to accepting insanity in some cases. Gender confusion from sin to mental illness to acceptance. You must accept everything. Ba Revelation, you know, uh, Babylon, uh, it, talking about Babylon and Revelation, it's, it's described as a great mystery religion. A great mystery. A lot of people don't understand and make the connection of Babel to many of the religions which will eventually become a one world religion in the book of Revelation. That's described, a, there's a description of a whore on seven hills. And everyone who lived when this was written knew about what city was built on seven hills. Does anyone in here know what city was built on seven hills? Rome. Rome, Rome was built on seven hills. You can look that up, Google that. Seven hills of Rome. And you'll see. Okay? So you remember when, when you see something, a writing, an ancient writing, you've got to consider it from the perspective of the people who were writing it and the audience they were writing it to. Context matters. So if some, you know, new city was built today on Seven Hills, well, you know, I'm his prophecy, so, you know. But you have to understand that he was giving a message to people in his own day. Oh, you I just, just looked, looked it up? At, I just looked at a map of it, <laughs> and it looks like where the Vatican now is, there used to be the Temple of Jupiter. Wow. And Jupiter, wow. Jupiter, a.k.a. Zeus. Yeah. Wow. And Zeus, uh, the god who, you know, uh, we were forced to, the story of Hanukkah we're talking about, right? An idol of Zeus was put in the temple, and they were forced to make sacrifices of pigs on the altar of God at the holy temple by the statue of Zeus. You want to know what the, the abomination of desecration, right? Uh, talk, spoken about in the book of Daniel? Well, take a guess. Okay. The seven hills of Rome. It's a religious system that embraces much like voodoo and pretty much anything else, almost anything, and pretty soon maybe it will be anything, with the idea of universalism incorporating all religions together. I mean, you don't want to offend anybody, right? <laughs> yeah. 
whatever you believe, that's okay. You believe this, I believe that. Kind of rhyme, it, it goes very well with the postmodern idea, right? Subjective truth, subjective reality, subjective religion. I'm not agreeing with it. <laughs> I heard a sigh over there. I was like, is that frustration with the, you know, society or? Make clear, I have not embraced that. Okay. So what does compromise with evil bring? Because there are people throughout time, and even today, who compromise with evil because it just seems like the, the easier way to go. It's the easier road. Just compromise. Okay, you just, I mean, you want to worship Baalzebub and make statues of him in the library in Louisiana or outside the courthouse? Well, you go ahead and set that statue up. Doesn't affect me. I'll be over here in my congregation worshiping, so, you know, whatever. You want to force uh, clergy who don't uh, accept the idea because they follow the Bible, you want to force them to, to, make, uh, to do ceremonies, marriage ceremonies between 13-year-old um, girls and, uh, and elephants, for example, because I know you can think of some other examples of your mm -hmm. own. Uh, well, that's okay, because that doesn't affect me. I'm not the clergy. Where, do you, where does it end when you're compromising with evil? And where does it lead when you're compromising with evil? Does it ever bring anything good? Nope. It just brings more evil. The compromise of the, of the story of Hanukkah, you know, it starts with the, the acceptance thing, and a lot of the Jewish people started to assimilate to the Hellenization. Before you knew it, there were gymnasiums where you know, the competitions, by the way, were naked and whatnot in the middle of the city, you know, next to the temple over there and a bunch of naked guys over here throwing javelins or whatever, right? <laughs> and, uh, and worship, starting to worship the, the pagan gods and goddesses. Uh, There's stories of rabbis in the middle of sacrificing, stopping everything to run over to watch the naked kids throwing javelins and the, the Hellenists. Yeah. Games. Yeah, it's very, it's very Real. disgusting. Before first century, Hellenism was taken over. Yeah, mm. eventually. The Romans got there, and the Greeks were there. So eventually, it's you know that might be tr that might be you know true for you, but it's not true for me. You do that, you do your thing, I'll do my thing, but eventually, that evil thing says that's not enough. Eventually, that evil thing takes over the temple. And when it takes over the temple, that's not enough. You have to conform to that evil thing. You have to make the sacrifice. Eventually, you come up and slaughter the pig on the altar of God in the holy temple. Eventually. You might see parallels to this, by the way, in our society today, if you think about it. Not when you evil. compromise with evil, you either keep compromising and things get worse and worse, right? Uh, it only invites more evil. Did you say? I was just going to say the, the problem with compromise is compromise turns into acceptance. It leads to acceptance. To assimilation, to synchronization. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. All right. And uh, there will be an ending, though, of this system one day, right? Yeah. There will be an ending. And you can read about that ending in books like Yechezkel, Ezekiel, and books like Daniel, and particularly in the 12th chapter of Daniel, if you're interested, and in books like Revelation. And this all is very similar to the story. As you've already picked up, I kind of threw some things out as we went along to the story of Hanukkah. What really is the theme of Hanukkah? Is it a theme of compromise? Is that what the Maccabees did? They said, this is a great, we should just live our life how we want and let them all do what they want. It was too late for that. The story of the Maccabees is the Syrian Greeks were, going, were forcing everyone, you know, 
to abandon the God of Adonai, sealed, not seal the door shut though, they took over the temple with the evil pagan gods. There wasn't a story, it wasn't a story of, uh, you know, tolerance. And it wasn't just about freedom politically. You know that, right? It's often portrayed as it's just a story of like independence. Well, independence brought with it something, the freedom to worship Adonai. And that was the motivator. There had been many years after Alexander, yeah, the Greeks ruled, but they were tolerating our worship of Adonai. So that was acceptable. But then there were steps taken over time till eventually mothers who circumcised their children were crucified and their intestines ripped out and the babies hung from their intestines. Eventually, the Syrian Greeks who knew that we had Shabbat on the seventh day of the week, when the rebellion started, purposely attacked on the seventh day of the week. Just like the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Okay, and there, there's so much more evil in that story. So there were stories of assimilation, there were stories of people who were uh, adopting Hellenism, but there were also stories of people who were being martyred. Uh, a woman with, I believe it was seven sons, you can read, you can, uh, read about uh, in the Talmud. And there's, most of the writings about, about Hanukkah are not actually in the Bible though, but there's some great stories. If you want some additional reading, let me know. Make sure I have your email address, and there's some, there's some great stuff out there about people who were martyred, for example. It's about dedication. Hanukkah is about dedication. We were reading this week in the Kings. We finally got a good king again. He's Kiyahu, or Hezekiah. He was a good one, and he reopened the doors to the house. When I say the house, you know it's talking about the temple to Adonai. He re was reestablishing the Kohanim and the Leviim. They were cleaning out, cleansing the temple in his time as well, and reestablishing the true worship of the true God in that house after his father was evil. Cleansing the house. Cleansing it from what? It tells us all unclean things. All un unclean things is what they were getting out of the temple. It was also an eight-day rededication. You see some similarities here with Hanukkah and the days of Hizkiyahu. They were reconditioning and consecrating the holy articles. It wasn't enough to get rid of the old unclean things. They had to restore pure worship. Restoring true, pure worship, including good music. If you read through the, the extent, right? Good, worshipful music that's oriented and focused on Adonai. Proper sacrifices, not just sacrificing anything you want, like a pig on God's altar, right? But s sacrificing the things he commanded to be sacrificed. And true prophets. I don't know if you've noticed, we've been reading there a lot. There were a lot of false prophets. Mm -hmm. We need more true prophets. That is people who speak the word of God, not whatever they, uh, whatever that will make them some money. <laughs> That's what some people speak. I saw someone this morning flipping through channels, right? I like to, I like to see if I get a little, a little uh, glimpse of what's being taught out there. You know, go through the different 59, 1, 2, 3, and 4, whatever. And one of the guys was, uh, I guess a, a Asian or something guy is very popular, fills whole stadium or something. He was talking about uh, yeah. 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 talking. He was talking about um, 
Uh, do, you really, do you really want great faith, he said? You want really great faith? You know, I found, there's, I found two places to talk about great faith. One is the centurion, and one was a, a woman up in, uh, in Phoenicia, right? And they have something, in, I, said, I told God, they want some great faith. And he said, well, study the Bible. And they, <laughs> he said, look at these two accounts and see what they have uh, in common. So I was looking, I was looking, he says. And I couldn't figure it out. I was looking for half an hour, I said. And being a quick reader and a quick study, you know, after half hour, I said, help. Because I can't figure it out. And he says that God told him. He says, God told him. That the thing those people who he just, who in scripture were defined as people with great faith were people who they weren't under the law. <laughs> so according to him, people who you know would live in this. First of all, he has no understanding of context and doesn't grasp what those people knew, uh, because yeah, they did know about the God of Adonai and they did know about his laws. And one of them, I, I believe, was even a God-fearer, which, if you know what a God-fearer is, means you're obeying God's laws. So not only does he not understand context, uh, but, he, you know, he doesn't understand the Brit Chadashah with a Messiah who said he did not come to abolish the Torah, who says that um, sin is lawlessness, said one of his primary disciples. Who we're not supposed to live in sin any longer, says another one of his disciples. And I could go on for days of all the scriptures that talk about, you know, it's just ridiculous that not under the law is so thoroughly misunderstood by some people that they come up with such horrendous theology that before you know it, they come to a time where everything that is Jewish, period, culture, whatever, is thought of to be evil, and they're burning people who are followers of Yeshua on stakes. I'm talking about the book I'm reading again, The Hidden Jews, who, you know, first of all, uh, Christians would go attack Jewish communities, forcibly throw, force them under the water, say, how many, how many, you're baptized now, you're a Christian, right? And then you have to pay taxes, you have to help fund the Crusades where we go and kill more Jews as well as Muslims, right? Uh, oh, very nice. And the Pope, when you complain to the Pope, would say, well, I don't agree with what they did. It was wrong that they did that. But you know, since you went under the water, our theology says you really are a Christian now, so pay up. <laughs> and then if, you, if you're still, after that happens to you, and you're still practicing the faith of your fathers, which is the same faith that Yeshua lived out during his life, and Shaul lived out, that's Paul, by the way, lived out during his life. If you did that in medieval Spain, after being dunked under the water, they would say, you lied. You know, if they forced you to make some vow, you lied. You're not really a follower of Yeshua, who they would use a different name to describe and yeah. instead of giving his Hebrew name. They would, and they would, they would give you a chance to, uh, to amend your ways and follow false teachings that began with at Bavel and, and they'd give you an extended period to change your ways under duress, meaning they would torture you until you confess and either A, change or B, you get burned at the stake. Which one would you do if it were you? Because there's a pattern, and we might see that pattern again. This happened with the Maccabees. And it seems like we're trying in some small way to do this, and it will happen again. If this isn't the Aharit Hayamim, the end of days, which maybe it is, but if it's not, it will happen in the Aharit Hayamim as well. 
when Yeshua returns, there will be another rest restoration of true worship. What we're trying to do here in this congregation is a, restore, a restoration of, of true worship. Trap, you know, we can examine traditions, and if they're good, if they're uplifting, if they're not against the scripture, fine. You don't have to do them, but fine. They can be useful, they can be edifying, but if there's some that go against the scripture, drop them. Drop them. Don't do things that, yes, there is an evil, and we don't want to go there. Adonai said to us, look, it's not all about what pagans did. Pagans went to the bathroom. If you want to avoid everything that pagans did, you can't go to the bathroom anymore. <laughs> they breathe air. <laughs> you can't avoid that. What God said, what Adonai said is, don't worship me the way that pagans worship their gods. Hmm. He told us how to worship him. That's how, this is how. Do this, not that. So if you find things in your tradition, things you've been doing that have pagan roots, you can see maybe you weren't thinking. See, here's, a, here's kind of a, a, a hitch, right? You might not be thinking of this as worship that you're doing. Some of those things, some of those traditions you need to reason that in your mind then, though. Do I want to do them anyway? Do I want to know that these, that these roots exist? Some of those roots will surprise you in just how evil they are. Some, eh. But regardless, God tells us not to worship him like pagans worship their gods. So you have to decide, is it worship when I'm doing this? Why am I doing this? You know, and, and that kind of attacks in some way the idea, the concept that some people put on some of the things. Well, we do this. We, I know pagans used to do this for reason X, Y, Z. We still do the same thing, but we don't do it for X, Y, Z. We do it for L, M, N, O, P. What are we really doing there? Well, aren't we, aren't we, if, it, if, if LMNOP has something to do with God, then are we, if we're attaching meaning to God from that, the God that we worship, maybe at some small way we are worshiping God in the way that pagans worship their gods, which is, what you're not which is exactly what we're not supposed mm -hmm. to do. I don't know. Use your own reasoning there. Tell me if you have trouble. <laughs> we can talk about it if you want. You don't have to. All right. So that's what we're trying to do here as well. Like the Maccabees, like his Kiyahu, we're trying to bring back pure worship from the text. You know, there are some traditions, of course, that Yeshua did. Someone, I saw a writing. Uh, some some people we know write some very good things sometimes, and and uh, just a little tidbit that that struck me. You know, Shabbat is a holy convocation. We've talked about that. What does it mean, a convocation? It's when you come together, you assemble together for. And a holy convocation means you're doing it for a holy purpose. You're coming to worship God. You come together to worship God. Now there are different ways you could have a holy convocation, right? You could have a holy convocation in your house. Matter of fact, we used to. We used to meet in Diana's house. We sometimes in someone else's house, right? We used to meet in our house sometimes uh, when we first started Kehilat Elohim. But we are supposed to have a holy convocation. You could do that in other places. You, you could do it as a congregation. You could, you could say, well, I don't need a congregation. I just have a holy convocation with my, with my granddaughter at the house. That's our holy convocation. There's the two of us. That's good enough for me, right? Could you do that? You could maybe. You could maybe think and reason out that way. Let's think about what Yeshua did. How did he understand the holy convocation of the Shabbat? What was his tradition? In other words, Shabbat is a commandment. Having a holy convocation is a commandment. But what tradition? What did he do? 
habitually every Shabbat. Where did he go for his holy convocation? He went to the synagogue. He went to the synagogue. Luke chapter 4. I don't know if you ever thought about that part, that as a tradition before. You know, he could have had his own little group in a tent or something. Yeah. <laughs> you know, he did preach out in the wilderness, but every Shabbat he went into the synagogue for the holy con con convocation, right? Anyway. What is Yeah, uh, so, okay. There, I, I have a great book I want to recommend to you. Remind me afterwards for some of this. Um, and really, in, in that world, there was generally a meeting house in each community. Each village would have a building where they conducted uh, political affairs as well as religious. You would have a court in the same building as, uh, and synagogue is really a Greek uh, word. There were two words in Hebrew, edat or kahila, for assembly or building, and they could be used interchangeably for that meeting house. And there were two words in Greek, they could also be used interchangeably. Neither one had anything to do with ethnicity, neither one had anything to do with religion specifically, and they were synagogue and ecclesia, or ecclesia. There was no tie, religious tie, to either of those words, right? No ethnic tie of any, either of those words. Those things were thrust onto those words later, if you've heard one of them means X and one of them means Z, for example, and I'm sure you have, some of you. Um, so really, it was a meeting house, the town's meeting house, all right, where uh, weddings would take place there. Uh, like I said, court would take place there. And religious services would take place there. Only for Jewish believers? or Well, in Israel, uh, <laughs> there would be Jewish believers. But there would also, you know, now we're talking more practice, not just what the, what the building is. Um, it depends. It depended. There's a process of conversion, and if you fully converted, you may be allowed inside the building. But generally, Gentiles, there might be a different area where Gentiles were, or you, if the building was too small, you might be on the outside looking in. If you're not, because it's you know the people of God. Have you fully have you become one of the people of God? And the process for doing that was different than it is since the new covenant has come into play. Now, for the Jewish world, as it's not different for the rabbinic Jewish world right? Uh, not too much different anyway. Um, but for us it is. Something that was required once to become part of the body of Messiah is no longer necessary. There's a, a lot in scripture about that and that is the circumcision. It's a big deal. In order to be saved it, because God accepted Gentiles without it as was proven at Cornelius' house, who was, by the way, a Roman centurion, yes, but also a God-fearer, which means he was following the Torah and all that. <laughs> he just didn't go undergo that last step. Who knows why? Maybe we could think of something. <laughs> oh, did I hit that? Okay, so warning. <laughs> so warnings. And it wasn't he happy when he found out he didn't have to. Um, <laughs> <laughs> of course, there is a ceremony. Well, yeah, let's leave that for another day. Uh, there are some warnings here. Don't let bitterness seep in. Share the truth and forgive. What am I talking about? When uh, people f start learning truths, that they did not hear in former places where people actually do believe sincerely in Yeshua, for example, and maybe the leaders do as well, but they start to learn some things. Why didn't you tell me about this? Why didn't you tell me about that? And they get angry and bitter and not just leave to find somewhere where they could worship more purely, but they get bitter and angry. We're not supposed to live in bitterness. We're supposed to be people who forgive. You have to keep in mind 
that a lot of the things that maybe you would be learning, they don't still don't even know. Now, there are some people out there who know some things and they're afraid to change because a lot of their congregation, they think, might leave. That's out there as well. There are people in congregations out there who know certain things, but, they, but they're just so comfortable with some of their traditions that they know or do not have good you know, foundations. But what would my family think? What would my other congregants think if I started doing this or stopped doing that? What's more important? What, when you're judged at the end, are they going to be there to say, well, yeah, we were pressuring them, so, you know, is that going to help? Is that going to stand up in the final court? But there are also people who just don't know just don't know. And what's worse, when they hear the truth, they don't want to act on it. Well, there's a whole range, right? Some people do, and some people don't. Some people keep teaching that some things they know are wrong. Some people, maybe they just avoid those subjects. I, I know, I went to seminary with some of these people, I'm telling you. <laughs> some of them, they just avoid certain subjects after they learn mm -hmm. something. And some will try to manipulate scripture to fit their agenda, to justify why they're doing what they're doing. Oh, come on, Keith, that never happens, does it? Never. <laughs> never. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so we don't want to let bitterness seep in, though. There are people out there, just because they don't meet with us, that, you know, there are different movements of God that all have... Uh, validity. There's a holiness movement that has great reverence for God, and I've got to respect that. I might not agree with everything they do or say, but I respect that. There are people who understand, there's a movement that's very open and, and understanding and, and really want to, wants to grasp that God is a God today, and he still moves among his people today, and he can do any kind of miracle that he's ever done in the past, he can still do today, and will do tomorrow, he can still do today as well. Adonai Melech, Adonai Malach, Adonai Yimloch, Lolam Vaed. Should sound kind of familiar. He's our God. The God of the past is the God today, is the God of the future. There's no shadow of turning. There's no change. He doesn't change yesterday, today, and forever. He's still a God today who does miracles. Amen. His arm doesn't grow short. He never slumbers or sleeps. He's not tired. It's okay. Ask. He does miracles. So there's a movement that, that, that focuses on that. I might not agree with all the theology sometimes that comes out along with that movement, for example, or some of the things they do, but I, I can connect with that because it's biblical. Does that make sense? Yep. And I see over time that there's a, there is a sort of restoration happening in the body of Messiah. That there is a, a, a process of purification going on. There are groups being I don't know if dragged, being, being led to more and more purity. I also see there are other groups that are going crazy, like way off. Mm -hmm. But isn't that what Revelation talks about? There'll be a, a great divide. A great divide. Shining your light is not about pride and arrogance. Don't do things. Now we're talking about what we were reading in Matith Yahu this week. And I think, I, I think this might be the last slide. We're talking about the teachings of Yeshua. And he was, this, one of the things he was saying in Matthew.
that's these Yahoo, that's Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, is don't, he was saying specifically, doesn't it fit? Don't let bitterness seep in. Share the truth and be a person who forgives because if you don't forgive other people, you won't be forgiven. Yeshua said. Shining your light is not about pride and arrogance. Don't do things like prayer and fasting and giving, some of which we hit last week, just for appearances. Notice I put the just in capital letters. Don't make earning a reputation your goal. The Purushim we talked about who's in the temple praying to himself. <laughs> right? Don't be praying to yourself. Praying is supposed to be to God, right? It's a conversation between you and God. It's not a time, your prayer isn't a time for you to be teaching the other people in the room stuff. <laughs> it's not a time for you to be bossing God around. You can make requests of God and you, can, you have the ability to do that and you can do it boldly knowing he's a God that loves you and will listen to you and knows your needs. But he's still God and you're not. You can remind him of promises he made, but you know what? He has the big picture and that may be as hard as it is to believe there might be some things that you don't know about. <laughs> some reasons why maybe you won't get what you want, but you'll get what's best for you. Mm -hmm. There are people who would pray, you know, Making really loud, remember we were talking about this last week, really loud prayers, which reminded us of what? The false priests on Mount Carmel at the showdown. And Eliyahu is sitting there mocking them. Why don't you yell a little louder? Maybe he's on the potty. Maybe he's on vacation. <laughs> right? People who give just to make a show of it. Some of this I'm recovering because there's no video of it, right? People who made a show of it. How many times you want to turn on your TV and rich Mr. Hominy Hom is, is standing there with a, with a, how big are your checks in your checkbook? I'm just curious. Mine's like this big. Yeah. But he's standing there with a check like this big and, and five, four people are holding it or whatever to get a picture and getting his name put on the front of a big hall. We're not supposed to do our charity or our praying or those kinds of things just to get a reputation for ourselves. Your legacy will make itself if you're doing what's right. You shouldn't make demands about your legacy. Let somebody else decide they want to put your name in a hall after you're dead or a library or whatever. Shining your light is not about pride and arrogance. People will honor you if you're worth honoring. Like in the kings, some of them were buried outside in the dung heap, and some were buried with the rest of the kings. Some were buried in the city, but not with the rest of the kings, right? The different levels. People will honor you how they will honor you, how you deserve, usually. Don't be stingy. Because 619 through 24 is all about that. It's all about being generous, not being stingy. Being stingy in Judaism is called, described as having the evil eye. You see somebody in need, and, and you might even be rich, but you just pretend you don't see them and go on your way, right? You see a poor guy on this side of the street, so you purposely cross to the other side of the street, so you won't have to come in contact with that. Don't be stingy. The Torah tells you differently. You are not to turn your back on the poor. And 
just talking about people you come in, that you see, that you come in contact with. It's not that you are responsible for every poor person in the world. No one could handle that. No one could handle that. But God. But pe God puts people in your path. And maybe sometimes it's a test for you. You come into contact with malachim, with angels. And you don't know that they are. And it's a test. And you don't know that it's a test. Sometimes we come up with excuses why we don't help people. I wonder if that's honoring God or not. Some things we think are just discernment, though, too, right? Sometimes God, God will prompt you if he really wants you to give something. He will prompt you sometimes if, you sh if, if, he see, if he knows something you don't know and you shouldn't go over to this particular person. And we know we live in an age where people set traps for people. Nevertheless, we're called to be generous. Don't be anxious. A lot of people are getting very anxious these days about a lot of things. But we're called not to be anxious. It says, you know, some people in the translation just say, don't worry. But it's really, don't be anxious. What does that mean? Anxiety. Like you're, you're, you're obsessed with certain things. That you, you just can't let go of them. You care so much, so deeply, and you're so worried about those things. See, that's where you get the word worry. So worried that it's like interrupting your life. You can't sleep. You can't eat. That's what he's talking about. Let go. God's able to take care of you. You just have to trust him. He'll work it out. He cares about you. Don't be anxious about life or provisions. Your clothing, the things you eat, or staying alive. It doesn't do any good for you to be anxious. It does give you psychological problems to be anxious all the time. Stress will mess you up. How many know that? Mm -hmm. You could get medical problems from being stressed. Don't be, so, I know it can be hard sometimes, but let go of the anxiety. It is what it is. What's this a common phrase these days, right? It is what it is. <laughs> you know, pray and trust God do what you can, but that's then let it go. Do what's right and repair your temple. Hanukkah's coming next this this week. What Wednesday? Wednesday, Thursday. 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 Thursday night. I I did that a few times today. And there's an event. You're all welcome to join us, right? There's an event. This one is at uh, Nakati. That, that one's at Nakati. It's not our event, not Messianic, but, you know, they invite everybody, so we can go there. And uh, that's the helicopter go drop. Mm -hmm. This one? Yeah, yeah it's pretty cool. Uh, I don't know. There's posters, posts on our page, though. I sent an email, too, to everybody. If somebody could check their email. If you didn't get an email, it's probably because we don't have your email address or something. at 6 p.m. at Nocatee Spray Park. Yep. And so that's for the first night, so we could do that together if you want. Um, and maybe when I finish here, we should talk a little bit about some of the basics of Hanukkah for people who haven't done it before, if you're not going to, and especially if you're not going to be able to go and make that. But do what's right and repair your temple, just like Hezekiah, just like the Maccabees, just like Yeshua is going to do when he returns, because you know that's going to be the worst temple of all, and he's going to have to come in. There's going to be some cleansing to do. That is the message. And next week will be all about Hanukkah specifically. What exactly happened? What is it that we're celebrating? And, for, and uh, from a historical perspective, from a prophetic perspective, from a perspective of believers, why is it important to every believer? Uh, Hanukkah, you know, what does it mean to you, whether you're Jewish or not? Um, so that's next week. So that's the message, but before I do uh, the blessing, maybe we we'll talk a little bit about, because a few days, like I said, a few days of Hanukkah will already have passed before we meet again. So one of the things that we do 
is a is called burning a uh, Hanukkah, Hanukkah, or a Hanukkah menorah. That's what a Hanukkah is. And who could tell me what's different about a Hanukkah from a normal men, from a regular menorah? Kind of eight, kind of eight, really nine, right? <laughs> right, right. And so there's eight of them are for eight days because the Hanukkah miracle, which you'll learn about next week, was eight days. Unless, <laughs> unless you care a whole lot and ask me later or something. Eight days. And then what's the ninth one for? What's it called? Shamash. Shamash. And what's it for? The servant candle. Yeah. Servant candle. What is it for? Lights it lights all the other candles, right. That's interesting, because Yeshua came to serve men, and he is the light of the world. But before he left, he said, you're the light of the world, right? You might say he lit our candles, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, again, and what is the festival about? It's about Hanukkah means what? Dedication. Dedication. Why do we celebrate? What? in shortest form as possible, like one sentence. Why do we celebrate Hanukkah? What happened that has to do with dedication? The temple was rededicated. The temple was rededicated. The temple of the Ruach HaKodesh. What was the last part? Our temple, our body is the temple of the Ruach HaKodesh. Okay. So the temple was rededicated. And how long does it take to dedicate the temple? We've seen it happen a few times. Eight days. Eight days. Interesting. Um, some say that Hanukkah may be. Oh, I should probably save that. Do with Yeshua. Okay? Try to save that. Okay. So what do we eat during Hanukkah? Fried stuff. Fried stuff. A lot of fried stuff. stuff. Yeah. What are the two most common? Latkes and the donuts. Fried. It's food that's fried in oil. Yeah, fried in oil is the key word. Right. And what's the Hebrew word for these donuts? Sufkanyo. Yeah, sufkanyo. Power, powder, and jelly filled and stuff, um, and the uh, and the latkes. So that's the food. Uh, there's no good Maccabee movies that I know of. There's one with Spock, Leonard Nimoy, that's really for kids. It's called Lights. You might want to check it out. I think you can find it for free. Uh, on, uh, on the internet, if you Google it, lights, Hanukkah story. And is Hanukkah in the Bible? Yes. yes. How many, where? Where is it in the Bible? In the Brit. Brit John chapter 10. John chapter 10, verse 22. Mm -hmm. So there's a story, that something that happens on Hanukkah. Now, in that story, because um, I'll probably do more of a historical thing. So in the Brit Hadashah, what happens in that story? So Yeshua, he's in, he's in the temple. Yeshua is in the temple. He's in the temple on Hanukkah. Where did Yeshua live? Up in Galilee. Up in the Galilee. Is that close? Is that like right next door? No. Not so much. It's kind of a long walk, right? Mm -hmm. So what are the possibilities for his being in the temple on Hanukkah? It would be A, he's there to worship and celebrate a traditional festival on Hanukkah. That would be the one we would probably go with. What are the other possibilities? B, he's just in the neighborhood because, you know, Galil is so close, but we just said he's not close. He's not close at all. You had to purposely go way out of your way to get to the temple on Hanukkah from the Galil. So it's not an accident. What's the third one? Maybe he's there to say, Hey, stop doing this Hanukkah. It's bad. It's pagan or something, <laughs> right? No. But if he did that, wouldn't it tell us then? Yes. Right. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't tell us that, does it? it tells Jews they're celebrating. So what logical, what logical reason is left? He gives an important he's message. He's there to celebrate Hanukkah. Yeah. And while he's there, yeah, because he's always giving a message about yeah. something, but his message wasn't about, and stop doing this Hanukkah stuff. It wasn't uh, even in there, right? No. It was, about, it was about being a good shepherd. Even though it's a tradition. You see? It's about God. being a good shepherd and a sheep. So you can read chapter 10 and see, what it, and see what it's about. And what he said was underneath these huge, you know, in the, in the uh, Mishkan, in the tabernacle, 
It was a uh, uh, menorah that's much bigger than my menorah at home, you know, maybe like this big or something. Yeah, like but, you know, and the new temple under Shlomo and then the new temple under Herod, they had like six, six or eight, I believe it was six, massive menorahs, massive menorahs. And he would have been saying these things. You can picture it in your mind now when you read the chapter that he's doing this in the light of these massive menorahs, you know. So might have added some, a little bit of depth. Okay. Uh, so, oh, so you get one of these Hanukkiahs. And if you don't have one, you could order one on Amazon Prime one day delivery. <laughs> or you could just get eight candles. If you have eight kind of candles in your house this year, right? So you're not in a crunch. And just line them up, right? And you use the Shamash candle. Huh? Yeah, they do have some like really, really inexpensive tiny ones or something like at Publix and Winn-Dixie or something. So, yeah. Party yeah. City also, Party City in Mandarin has some Hanukkah decorations. Right. Too. So I'm just saying, you know, if you're penniless or something, but you have some candles, you could line them up. <laughs> and again, you'll need nine of them, right? Eight in a row. And you have to set one of them off on the side. That's the Shamash candle that sort of stands for Yeshua. And each night you're going to light one candle, like night moment number one, you're going to light one candle. Which side traditionally you're supposed to light? The right, the right side. The right side, right. Night number two, you're going to light how many candles? Two. Technically well, three because the shamash, right? Well, not candles. But yeah, two, two of the eight with the shamash. And you always light the other ones with the shamash candle, representing Yeshua is where our light comes from. To us is what we could say. So you light the two of them. Which of the two out of the eight do you light first? The one we light. The first one. No. So you put the when you when you if you're putting candles into a menorah into a Hanukkah, by the way, you put them in from right to left, mm -hmm. and then you light them from left to right. It's all tradition. If you do it some other way, no one's gonna God's not gonna be mad at you or something. But that's the tradition, okay? So you put them in from right to left. You light them from left to right. Load them this way, and light them that way. All right. Oh, I should do it backwards though, because you're. Put them in this way, light them that way. All right. Um, so you know the Hanukkah. Now I have a uh, list with, you know, just lighting a candle. I mean, think about the miracle. What is the miracle supposedly that happened on Hanukkah? They had to make oil. So let's back up a little bit, though. So remember, it's about the Syrian Greeks had conquered, and they would take over. They put up the statue of Zeus and stuff, and they were they were sacrificing pigs on the altar and everything. So just like in the days of Hezekiah, right, when we took, retook the temple, we had to cleanse the temple and repair things. And when we were doing the repairing, first of all, the menorah was broken, had to repair the menorah, right? And another thing is this. Can you burn just any kind of oil in the menorah? No. No, there's a special mix. The Torah tells you how to make this mix. How long did it take to prepare the oil that you needed to burn in the menorah? Eight days. Eight days. Now, all, did they find any oil of the right kind in the temple? Yes. They have one day's worth of oil. One day's worth of oil. So they had a choice. They could either, you know, they could either light it right away and then watch it go out. And then, you know, you light it, that you inspire the people. Look. We've retaken the temple. God is back with us. See, his light is in the temple because it's his light, right? His light is in the temple. We should join that. Yeah, these guys, the rebels were right. We should join with them in the revolt, right? It's our land again and this sort of thing. But then the next day it would go out, <laughs> right? So do you do that or do you wait the seven days before you light it? So there's a choice to make. And they stepped out in faith and lit the menorah anyway for that one day and put it in God's hands. They weren't anxious about it. They put it in God's hands. They did what they could do, and they let it go. And what happened? A great miracle. It lasted eight days until more oil was available. And, it, and that really inspired the nation. At least that's the story. Where do we find that story? Do we find that story in the scripture? No. No. 
Now, where do we find the story? Maccabees. Now it's not in the Maccabees either. No, it's, not it's in the Talmud. Talmud. <laughs> it's oral. The only place, yeah. yeah. Well, no, no, the Talmud is written, but. Uh, okay. Did they light all eight of them, or just? One? Oh, they lit all. Uh, well, what they lit was the the menorah in the temple. So that had how many branches? Six. Seven. 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 We remember the event by a special menorah that has nine for the eight days and the service, right? Yeah. Uh, so when you're doing it, think about the miracle. Think about how God comes through with miracles. When you can't do anymore, he's still there for you. You don't have to be anxious. Right? Um, and remember, the, you know, that's for us personally, but we can remember the miracle that shows that to us and what happened with the Maccabees. And there was a literal miracle that we do know about that is in the scripture a little bit in a way, and it's also very clearly spelled out in the Maccabees. There's another Hanukkah miracle. And that was, an, an, there was those military victories were amazing, miraculous victories. The odds were incredibly stacked against them. And you can read about that in the books of the Maccabees. Okay? So whether or not the light thing is true, not totally sure. But the military victory, we know that that, that, that happened. Uh, so. And that's why we eat food with oil, because we're remembering the miracle had to do with oil. That supposed to be a miracle anyway. But if Yeshua wasn't in the temple at that time, it would have been recorded so we'd be able to Oh, we're talking about in, in Rit Chodeshah. Yeah. Well, we knew he was celebrating Hanukkah. Whether he was validating the miracle about the menorah, I don't know. <laughs> but, if he you know. Wasn't, he he might have mentioned it if it was wrong. Exactly. <laughs> he doesn't say anything. He doesn't right? say anything. Because he tended but to he say was, things. But he was there the, celebrating. The big, yeah. miracle, the big miracle that we, that we don't want to miss is, is the one that we do know about. Yeah. Because that was impossible. Those odds were impossible. And we sing a song mm -hmm. every Hanukkah about the miracle. And we don't sing about burning oil. We sing, we sing that his word broke their sword when our own strength yeah. failed us. Mouse tour, who can retell? I love who can retell, but can't find a good version and of it. And we don't want to miss that because we can get caught up with all the lights and the and the blocks yeah. and the shanya and you know, and then we yeah. go to Christmas. <laughs> well, and some people do. Yeah, they have the Hanukkah have bush have and Saint Nicholas Diner. We don't want to miss. We and, don't want to uh, miss when, yeah. we, when we spin the dreidel and a great miracle happens here. The dreidel. We don't want to miss. Yeah. Right. So the dreidel has interesting connection, though, too. We'll throw that out, because next I'm talking about, you know, what happened. So the dreidel. Have you seen the dreidel? It's kind of like a top, but it's got four sides, right? What's on the four sides? Four olive beds. Four olive beds? Four. Yeah. Four. Well, it depends on where you are. The race. Yeah. Sheen. Sheen. Gimel. Gimel. Noon. Noon. And pay, or hay, yeah. Uh, no, no, hay would be here. Pay is there. <laughs> yeah. Why is that? Nezgadol. It's a, each letter is the beginning of a word. Nezgadol. Nezgadol. Some of you should know gadol. Great. 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 So nez then is probably. What? Because great is is the miracle adjective great. modifying something. What? Miracle. Nes gadol. A great, and there's no indefinite article in Hebrew, so a great miracle. Nes gadol. Haya is the hay, actually. So hay is on all of them. Haya. Happened. And then you have, if you're living out here, we get one that has a sheen on there, right? And then you lose two points. But it's <laughs> 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 if it lands on the sheen, it's not so good. Uh, happened there. 
but when you know Sham there, because you learn modern Hebrew, some, you know, remember Sham? And then uh, if you live in Israel, though, they sell them with a pay on there for pole here. A great miracle happened here. Yeah. And why do we do the game with the top, though? And you know, there's either, like Gimel, you get everything. Hey, you get half out of the pot, and, no. and you know, you make a game out of it or whatever. Well, why do we do that? What do we play a game for? That was the, well, the grain was that the, the toy for the children with the Hebrew letters on it that they were teaching the children um, with Hebrew, or they were teaching the children unbeknownst to the government. Right. And it was illegal. If you got caught with a Torah, you were tortured and killed. If you were teaching your kids the Torah, if your kids had a Torah, they would be tortured and killed. So they would, but they would, did that stop them? No, they would still, they would sit and they would study, they'd have a lookout. And they would, the kids would be studying the Torah and if the lookout tells them, somebody's coming, roll up the Torah, hide it, and you get out your toy dreidels and you're playing, you're just kids playing a game in the street. <laughs> they were gambling with their lives. If the soldiers walked in, they had the gelt and they had the dreidels. But they were also gambling with their lives. They go, go ahead. Right? Go on, go to the gamble. That's fine, as long as you're gambling. Yeah, because the idea of truth is <laughs> and morals has changed, right? Anyway. Uh, what else should we know before? Because there's some people who haven't done this before, have I missed anything as far as observance? I'm going to cover, you know, what happened historically and prophetically next week a little more. So keep this in mind, and maybe you could tell this to friends, I suppose, right? One of the most important aspects about, uh, about Hanukkah, and maybe also a miracle as well, is that the line of the Messiah would have been wiped out. Look, think about it. Yeshua had to come as a what? Sinless sacrifice in order for him to be able to take everyone else's sins on himself. Because you can't, be, I, I can't be on death row with you, already condemned to die, and yet somehow take your place and let you go free because we're both already condemned to die. It takes a sinless, perfect sacrifice to take the sin of everybody else. And if there's no temple for him to be able to follow the Torah, you know, because the Torah says you have to go there three times a year. You have to make these, you know, sacrifices. You have to be circumcised. You have to go and be dedicated. You have to do all these things. And some of them you have to do at a functioning, ta a te functioning temple. If there's no temple, if there's no Judaism anymore because it's been taken over by Hellenism, by assimilation, by synchronization... How can you grow up with parents that are telling you what, you what you're supposed to do and actually do it? How can you do some things that require a temple? There's no temple there. The Hanukkah, the, the Maccabees, saved the, the, uh, the whole thing. There could be no Messiah. Well, there could be a Messiah, but then he could have failed because there's no, he couldn't accomplish the mission. Well... Maybe there's some other way. He could have came and been a different kind of Messiah and beat everybody up or something and built a new temple by himself. No one's, I don't know. You could go into hypotheticals. But not the way it's supposed to be. Without the Maccabees, there's no Messiah. I think that's worth everyone celebrating Hanukkah. Absolutely. Anyway. Anything else? No? Let's get out of here? Is that what I heard? <laughs> hey. Uh, one, two, three. I know some people like to run out the door, so. Me? <laughs> So you're welcome to join us. So if you didn't raise your hand, I think I got everybody else. Family. Uh, so you're welcome to join us. At those, there's two events, one on, Wednesday, on this Thursday night and one on the following Wednesday night, I think, at yeah, I World think Golf think Village there's Hall of Fame. There's a third event I saw, too. They usually have one at Town Center, but I haven't seen it yet. 
So look on our uh, Facebook. You'll see them both posted. If uh, all the information is not there, let me know. And we'll get it to you. There's okay? one on Sunday the 13th as well. Um, but it looks like it's at Chabad. Uh, actually at right. their, I think it's at their actual building. Yeah, we're not doing that one then. Right. <laughs> Right. Yeah, but keep, you could keep your eyes open if you see something. You usually have uh, another lighting on, and it usually is on the weekend at Town Center. Um, there's a little median area where they usually have something. Sometimes it's really good. They like get a juggler. There was one time they had a guy on a unicycle, juggling like flaming, you know, things or whatever. And one time they had an archery person. Uh, I don't think it was the same year. He wasn't like shooting the torches or so. Anyway, so and that was pretty cool. But last year I think it was almost nothing. Last year or the year before it was almost think, nothing. Did they have it last year? I didn't go last year. Like they just had cookies in a raffle or something. Or latkes in a raffle. Anyway, you never know. It's good to go out and be a part of the com larger community though, right? Mm -hmm. And celebrate something like this together. And maybe, you know, you never know what kind of opportunities might happen. A uh, chance to share a little something, maybe. Who knows? Okay. Enough. I hope you found uh, everything edifying and that you can use the things you learn here, that your faith is bolstered, that there are things that you, can, you feel inspired to share with other people about Mashiach, about the context of the scriptures, about you know deeper meanings for some of the things that he taught. And that you can do it without any bitterness and in a spirit of love. Because we're called to love our neighbor as ourselves. but not at the expense of loving God. That's the first priority. That's not why we don't fall into assimilation or synchronization or Hellenization or compromise of our faith. Adonai bless you and keep you. Adonai make his face to shine out on you and be gracious to you. Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom. B'Shem Yeshua. Amen.